can hear the fan. Bruchem Aboyim. Fans, welcome to our home. Thank you very much for attending. Um, the lecture tonight will be called Write It Down. Now, the topic this week on my thoughts is on, an import, on the importance of writing things down. <laughs> I've actually thought about addressing this topic many times before, but somehow I always forget to write it down, and so I, it never happened. And that's the reason why I believe that writing things down is so very important. Our minds are a clutter of many different thoughts and ideas, things that we should do or want to do, some of those things that are important and others that really are not. Now, thoughts and ideas, I think, are like the clouds in the sky. Though they exist, in many ways they have no real permanence. Rain, the product of the clouds, is tangible. It is not the clouds that make things grow. It is the rain that promotes growth. Rain permeates the soil, and much like sperm, and that makes things grow. So too, when we write things down, <clears throat> we allow that information that we have acquired to be internalized into our minds. However, when all we do is listen, uh, then we, our minds have a tendency to drift, what we call daydreaming. But when we write things down, well, we are forcing ourselves to focus, to stay in the moment. When you listen to a lecture, many times it's, it's like the clouds. Even if you found the lecture interesting and informative, more often than not, after you leave the lecture, if someone were to ask you about what the lecturer said, well, you'd be hard-pressed to repeat anything specific. On the other hand, if you happen to take notes during the lecture, then the lecture would be like rain that has substance and has the ability to make things grow. By attending the lecture, you have done more than just entertain yourself. You have allowed yourself to acquire and hopefully retain knowledge. Even if you forget the ideas presented in the lecture, your notes will remind you even after a period of time has elapsed. Now, an extensive body of research has shown the benefits of writing about traumatic experiences or difficult situations. Psychologists refer to this as expressive writing. Hundreds of studies over several uh, de uh, de decades have found that expressive writing can strengthen amazingly the immune system, including for people with illnesses such as cancer, PTSD, depression, asthma, and arthritis. Researchers have also found that it can help reduce chronic pain and inflammation, in addition to improving one's mood, sleep, and memory. Again, it may even help reduce symptoms of depression, PTSD, and amazingly, even prevent colds and flu. Expressive writing works because it allows you to make meaning out of a painful experience. Now, our experts tell us recognizing that something is bothering you is an important first step in dealing with the issue. Translating that experience into language forces you to organize your thoughts, which then creates a narrative that gives you a sense of control. Writing can increase someone's acceptance of their experience, and acceptance is a calming force. You know, many times people are reluctant to face their emotions. The mere act of labeling a feeling by putting emotions into words can dampen the neutral activity in the threat area of the brain. Re research suggests that expressive writing can lead to lowering depressive symptoms, a greater positive mood, and an enhanced appreciation for life. Now, I personally experienced the benefit of expressive writing when I contracted COVID-19. This pandemic seems to have brought out the worst in family and friends. There were things that were said to me, things that hurt deeply. So I wrote my feelings out in one of my thoughts. I wrote a blistering my thought lecture, which to my surprise actually helped me to come to grips with my depression and disappointments. I later rewrote certain parts of my lecture, but first I needed to express 
my deepest feelings of pain and disappointment before I could dismiss them. On the positive side, there are many events in our lives that we cherish and want to enjoy and remember forever, such as marriage or the birth of a child or even the death of a loved one. I always tell a bar mitzvah boy who is putting on his tefillin for the first time that they should write down their thoughts. I think that it is both important and productive. Mitzvahs that we perform daily become habitual. We do them many times really out of rote, which with very little, if any, thought. However, if you write down how you feel when you first place the filling on your arm and on your head, it could be helpful in reigniting the flame of excitement that you felt when you put them on for the first time, when you read what you had written in the past. If an idea or even an important if, if an idea or event is important enough for you, then you should write it down. Some people think that this is only for older adults who forget things. I think that though it may be more prevalent among older people, forgetting is a condition that exists in all people at all ages. Some people just do better than others, but everyone, everyone forgets something sometimes. Interestingly enough, forgetting is a gift from God Almighty. You know, in the Hebrew language, the word for happiness is simcha. The word simcha can also be read as shemocha, which translates to mean to erase. The only way that a person can be truly happy is if they can forget a race. If you remember everything that you've experienced in life, then happiness may be a state of mind that is difficult for you to reach and to retain. Forgetting can actually be a blessing since it can help us to move past many of the challenges and difficulties of our lives. Our sages tell us that the year of mourning for a loved one helps us to manage our grief. Now we see an allusion to this concept in Psalm 31:13, where King David, Devonamel, the author of Psalms, laments that Nishkakti kemes me leg. I am forgotten like a dead man out of the mind. God has given us the ability to forget in order to help us to diminish the pain that we experience, especially with the passing of a loved one. Then over time, with the help of God, we learn to file our feelings in a place that is acceptable. We read in the Torah that when Yosef was sold into slavery, his father, Yaakov Avinu, Jacob our father, believing that Yosef had died, mourned for his favorite son Yosef for 22 years. He could not be consoled. But why? The reason given was that somehow he never felt closure. Since unbeknownst to him, Yosef really wasn't dead. Yosef was alive and well living in Egypt, first as a slave, then as a prisoner, and finally as the viceroy. That was the reason that Yaakov Sar could not be consoled, since he wasn't mourning for the death of his son. So he concluded, based on the fact that his acute pain and grief never diminished, that at the beginning of each of those 22 years, that it was that previous year that Yosef must have died, since he was not able to be consoled about the death of his favorite son the year before. We learn about the importance of writing things down from actually from God Almighty himself. We read in the Torah that when God gave over his Torah to the children of Israel on Mount Sinai, he personally wrote the Ten Commandments on the two tablets that he gave to Moshe to present to the Jewish nation. In addition to the two tablets, God again personally dictated all the words of the Torah to Moshe. Moshe wrote them down, each and every word that God spoke, much like a court stenographer. Not only did God speak to him, in addition, God spelled out each and every word for Moshe to see. He did so with black fire on white fire. Then Moshe, before his death, wrote down all the Torah on parchment for the Jewish people to study for eternity. Now this was a necessity since there are words in the Torah that are written one way and pronounced another, 
what is referred to as a kari and a ksiv. How a word is read, kari, and how a word is written, ksiv. In addition, when God gave the Jews the Torah, he also gave them the Hebrew alphabet, which consists of only 22 letters. Now, until this time in history, knowledge was transmitted through symbols and hieroglyphics. The Chinese language consists of well over 20,000 characters called logograms. It is the oldest continuously used system of writing in the world. Now, the Torah was given to the Jewish nation in two forms. What we refer to as the written Torah, Torah Shebik Sab, and the oral Torah, Torah Shebal Peh. The written Torah that Moshe wrote down was sealed on the day that he died. On the last day of his life, Moshe wrote 13 Torah scrolls, one for each of the 12 tribes, and the 13th Torah scroll was used as a proofreader. It was kept safe and secure in the Holy of Holies, together with the Ark of the Covenant. By his action, Moshe had fulfilled the last of the 613 commandments, all of which he had taught the children of Israel in the desert. He sealed the Torah with the last commandment, which is to write a Torah scroll. As one can imagine, writing a Torah scroll is very expensive and not within the means of most people. So how are we all expected to fulfill this commandment? Now, according to Jewish law, to the Torah, if one letter in a Torah scroll is missing or added, that Torah scroll is invalid. That being the case, if a Torah scroll was to be missing one letter and you replace that one letter, it would be considered as if you wrote that whole Torah scroll. And this is the reason why those who donate Torah scrolls to synagogues have their scribe leave out some verses at the end of the Torah. They do this on purpose so that other people who could never be able to afford to commission the writing of a Torah scroll would be able to participate by adding a letter. By allowing others to participate, they all fulfill their mitzvah of writing a Torah scroll. The Torah scrolls that we read from today are exactly the same as the Torah scrolls that Moshe wrote down before his death. It makes no difference whether you read from a Torah scroll anywhere in the world. They are all identical. Orthodox Jews read from a kosher Torah scroll a minimum of four times weekly. Now, Torah is many times compared to water. It is a fact that one could live without water for only three days. So Moshe instituted that we read congregationally from a Torah scroll at least once every three days. As we recite in our evening prayers every day, Ki heim chayenu v'orach yameinu, for they, including alluding to Torah and mitzvot, are that which gives us life and sustains and organizes our days. In addition, we refer to the Torah as Eitz Chaim Hilamach Zikimba, to a tree of life for those who support it. The oral Torah was taught by Moshe orally to the people. Before his death, Moshe instructed the people to continue to observe this practice. That practice was continued for some 1,500 years. However, after the destruction of the Second Temple, there was a concern that due to the exile of the Jewish nation and all the difficulties and hardships that they would be forced to endure, that the Ora Torah would be forgotten. So Rabbi Yehuda HaNasi, known as Rebbe, in approximately the year 200 CE, gathered all the sages of the generation together, and then he edited what we call today the Mishnah, a word in Hebrew that translates to mean study by repetition. It is a compilation of all the private notes and debates that were kept by the sages. Rebbe edited them in a concise and abbreviated form so that the laws would not be lost. Then, in the year 500 CD, an elucidation of the mission was edited by Rav Ashi, referred to as the Babylonian Talmud, or Talmud Bavli. It consists of 63 tractates, which contain a variety of subjects, including Jewish law, Jewish ethics, philosophy, customs, history, and even folklore. The Babylonian Talmud is the basis 
for all codes of Jewish law, and it is quoted often in other Jewish literature. The Jeru Jerusalem Talmud, known as the Talmud Jer uh, Yerushalmi, actually preceded the Talmud Bali by some 200 years. It is written in Jewish Palestinian Aramaic, whereas the Talmud Bavli is written in Aramaic. The Talmud Yerushalmi is thought to have probably originated in Tiberias, in the school of Rabbi Yochanan bar -Nafa. It was thought to have been edited around the year 350 CE. In comparing the two, the Babylonian Talmud is much more long-winded and discursive, involving extensive explanations and abstract conceptualizations containing forced interpretations of early sources. The Babylonian Talmud is, more often than not, seen as a more authoritative of the two. It is studied much more than the Jerusalem Talmud. So what we see is that the early sages understood the importance of writing it down. I wondered if writing down words of Torah might be a means for us to somehow correct the sin of Adam, first man, when he ate from the tree of knowledge. When he and Chava sinned, they did so with four out of their five senses. It says that initially she listened to the snake and then Chava, and then, pardon me, Adam listened to Chava, his wife, the sense of hearing. So we correct that sense by listening to a Torah lecture where we write things down, we take notes. Then it says that she saw that the fruit was pleasant to the eye, the sense of sight. To correct that sense, we therefore look at the written word whenever we write. She then offered him the fruit and he took the fruit from her hand, the sense of touch. To correct that sense, we place a pen in our hand whenever we write. In addition, it also says that they ate from the fruit with their mouth, the sense of speech, to correct that sense. When we write things down, we automatically move our lips at the same time. The only sense that was not tainted by Adam and Chava was the sense of smell. That being the case, this may be the reason that when God created Adam, first man, it says, Vayipak bi'ap of nishmas chayim and he blew into his nostrils the breath of life, the only sense that remained unsullied by their sin. This also may be the reason that a sacrifice to God is referred to as a reach nichoach l'ashem, a sweet-smelling savor to God. So by us listening and writing down ideas and words of Torah, we may well be instrumental in helping to correct the sin of Adam and Chava, who ate from the tree of knowledge. You know, I'll talk to you about my friend, Rabbi David Poulter. He added that the written word is printed on paper. Paper, of course, comes from, it, from trees. It is one of the products that we make from its wood. It is through the medium of paper that we have the printed word and are therefore able to acquire knowledge. So every time we study or pray from a book printed on paper, we offer an atonement for Adam and Chava for eating from the tree of knowledge. In addition, he mentioned that the words in the third paragraph of the Shema Yisrael, which states, Ura Isem, and you will see them, alluding to the written word, Uzachartem, and you will remember them. That by reading the written word, it will help you to remember all that you have learned. You know, on a practical note, I constantly write down my thoughts in addition to goals that I want to remember. Sometimes, I, I even get up in the middle of the night, if a thought comes to me while I lie in bed. I don't want to lose the inspiration. If I don't write down my initial thought immediately, then many times it is lost. And even if later I do remember the idea somehow, trying to recreate that thought with the same words is many times not quite as inspirational as I had phrased it initially. Trying to create, recreate. A passing thought is many times an exercise in futility. In addition, I also write in my Sfarim, my Hebrew books, words that I don't know the translation to. Uh, many times we don't appreciate just how far we have come in life and how much we have actually learned. When I review a Sefer, a book that I had learned previously, and I see a word that I had written down the translation for in the past, and I realize that now 
I wouldn't need to do so. You know, it gives me a, a true sense of accomplishment and a sense of joy. At work, I tell my managers again and again, write things down. When we rely on our memory, things are forgotten. When you write them down, you don't forget. It makes you better. It makes you much more efficient in every facet of your life. Many times, just writing things down makes a lasting impression that remains in your memory. The written word is what Orthodox Judaism is all about. We learn and study from a Sefer, a book, and we pray from a Sidur, a book. When the Tzermach Sedek, the third Lubavitcher Rebbe, began writing on Talmudic and Hasidic discourses and subjects, the Alter Rebbe, the founder of Chabad Muma, said to him in Pirkei said to him that in Pirkei Avos, in the Ethics of the Fathers, it states, and acquire for yourself a friend. The Alter Rebbe suggested to his grandson that with a slight change in the vowels, the saying can also be read, which translates to mean that the quill shall be your friend the power of the written word. I read once that studies have proven that those who read from the printed word books live on an average of 20 months longer than those who do not. Now, even the Rebbe, Rebbe Nachman Mendel Schneerson's Italian, would have a group of men called Chosrin, which translates to mean those who would repeat, transcribe his lectures. The Rebbe would always give a discourse on Shabbat and on Yom Tovim, the holidays, when one is not permitted to record or take notes. This gifted group of individuals would then memorize his lectures. Then shortly after the Shabbat or Yom Tov, they would record all of his public discourses into the written word. The compilation of notes would then be submitted to the Rebbe for his approval. He would make his corrections and then they would be transcribed at a later date. This allowed his many followers to review all the Torah that the Rebbe had given over. You know, we also find an allusion to the importance of writing it down in the only prayer that we recite daily that is Torahic, the Shema Yisrael. In the first and second paragraphs of the prayer, we say, Ukasavtam, and you shall write them, Amazuzel Beisecha Uvisharecha upon the doorpost of your house and upon your gates. It should state, ukusamtam, and you shall place them, not ukusamtam, right. The wording may be an allusion to the fact that we place a Torah, that probably we place a scroll upon which is written the first paragraph, the Shema Yisrael, on our doorpost, what the Torah refers to as a mezuzah. So the holiest prayer that we recite daily and that which we affix to the doorpost of our homes informs us about both the importance and the necessity of writing it down. There's a reason why God Almighty wrote down his thoughts on the two tablets, in addition to what we refer to as the written Torah. Nothing is an accident. The Torah tells us, and you shall go in his ways. The Torah is an instruction manual. And it is teaching us that to be successful in life, one should emulate all of God's traits. That being the case, write it down. It's the godly thing to do. So let us write a short note to God Almighty and say to him that we've waited long enough. It's time for him to bring Mashiach Sakana now. Again, thank you very much for attending and for listening. Um, if you found something interesting, write it down. <laughs> um, God should bless you and yours with health and safety and happiness. And again, uh, by the way, the next two weeks, there will be no classes. Um, I, my wife and I are going to take a vacation for, for a little while. And uh, hopefully we'll be back three weeks from now. And uh, enjoy, stay safe, stay happy. And again, God bless you and yours. Thank you very much for attending.